So, welcome to episode 84 of the podcast. So, uh, a phenomenon that's been in the news uh, fairly often of late, and most recently with, uh, well, I, I'll let me start off by saying I don't know how this gentleman's name is pronounced. I don't know if it's Jussie Smollett or Jussie Smollett, but Jussie, we'll, we'll just call him Jussie. We'll, uh, he is an actor um, on um, a show called Empire, and... He was apparently dissatisfied with his pay, and so he um, he he's black black guy, and he hired a couple of guys to attack him, assault him, as a fake hate crime. So uh, I don't know if he was going to get attention or celebrity status or raise, um, you know, have his stature raised in the sight of the public or become uh, have greater name recognition or what. But it was a fake hate crime. All right, so. Fake hate crime. Now, what what are we to make of this? First, the the obvious thing is that you don't want you don't want to overlook the fact that uh, the that the fake hate crimes are happening in order to sustain a narrative. I was just talking to my son Nate um, um, about the Oscar winning. Uh, Film. I think it's called The Green Mile. And um, anyway, uh, there were a lot of people who were really upset at the um, at the fact that it won the Oscar. And 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 Nate said he figured out why um, why people were so upset is because it was showing it was showing uh, America back in the uh, uh, Jim Crow days when there really was uh, racial uh, animosity and malice and abuse and you know and things were bad that way and what people have um, not come to grips with is that the progressives the liberals the leftists ha- have as part of their narrative the fact that they, they say things have not improved at all so uh, America is as racist as it ever was uh, take America in 1950 or America in 1930. There were all these racial abuses, and the leftist narrative is that all the all that seething racism is still here, and it's just gone underground. It's it pops out in microaggressions and different things, but it's all still here. We're it's all just as bad. There has been no improvement. Uh, we have not gotten better. There's been no progress when it comes to race relations. And so when people go to this movie and they say, you know, crikey, look how bad it was back then. The, one of the first takeaway points is I'm glad it's not that way now. I'm, I'm glad we've uh, got, gotten past that. Well, no, the liberals have, have a, a fundamental need for us not to have gotten past that. And so in order to sustain that narrative – you have to have hate crimes. You've got to have people uh, hanging nooses on college campuses and and leaving hate notes um, on the doors of uh, uh, blacks in dorms. And and, and in this case, uh, uh, Jussie uh, needs to be attacked by a couple of black guys and then make a claim that he was attacked by some MAGA hat wearing Trump supporters and in, in order for it to be a hate crime. So that's one thing. Uh, one thing is that the, the proliferation of fake hate crimes is intended to sustain a narrative. And the narrative is uh, all the progress you think we've made in race relations is, uh, is false. We've made no progress at all. So that's one point. The other is, is this, um, and I'm going to appear to change the subject for a minute. Um, but I'm illustrating uh, illustrating a point. Let's say you've got a small, tightly knit group. Let's say a, uh, a sailors on a ship, a, a submarine with a small crew, and you're 400 feet down in in the Atlantic somewhere, and somebody steals something. Now, the, what I'm about to explain is why the Navy or any unit that cares about morale at all takes a very dim view of this sort of activity. And this is, this is the reason. Somebody steals something. They take something 
belonging to someone else. And it's obvious that the the item is gone. It's obvious that somebody somebody on board took it. And what are we going to do? Now, the thief in this in this scenario, the thief is a thief. That's one thing. But the thief is also a slanderer. The thief has caused a cloud of suspicion to come to rest on everybody else there. So the thief has said, I want your wallet. And metaphorically, he points to everybody else on the, on the submarine um, saying, and I want you to have a dark cloud over your head, and I want you to have a dark cloud over your head. I want all of you looking at each other sideways as though any one of you could have done it. So he, what he's doing is he's wrecking the morale of that unit. If it's just a matter of taking the money, that is a crime in itself. Let's say he stole someone's wallet uh, as they were coming into port and, and then went AWOL. He stole someone's wallet and disappeared. And so in the morning, the wallet's gone and the thief is gone and everybody knows who did it. Well, that guy is just a thief. The, the guy who um, sticks around, who takes the wallet and is acting, standing there fat-faced like, well, I don't know, I, and he denies doing it. Someone in a closely knit community who does something evil, does something wrong, and doesn't confess, that person is a slanderer. That person is an accuser. And that slandering, that slandering and that accusing means that that person is being diabolical because that's, that's what the devil does. The devil accuses. Now, it might be if there's just 10 people in the, uh, in the unit, it's not a full tilt slanderous accusation. I'm claiming that you did it. What I'm doing is I'm saying there's a one-tenth of a chance that you did it. And I'm assigning that, that one-tenth of a slander to you and then another tenth of the slander to you and so on. So, bring this back to the fake hate, fake hate crimes that we're, um, that we're seeing proliferating. What's happening is uh, the, the fakery means that there's an accusation embedded in it. If someone, um, if someone sends threatening messages to themselves, if someone uh, hires some goons to, to act like they beat him up, if someone uh, uh, pens a death threat against himself and tapes it to his own door, uh, that, that person is not just lying, that person is also slandering. So we're continuing on with episode 84 in our podcast. And my book review this, uh, um, this time around is one I just recently finished, and it's uh, by Tilly Dillahay. Uh, and the title is Seeing Green. Seeing Green. Now, uh, this is just, this is the subject of the book. What the book deals with is the sin of envy and how destructive it is and how to deal with it. It's just a, and this is just simply a fantastic book. I would, uh, I would five star this one. Um, and it is the kind of book, it, it's the kind of book that's straightforward, simply written, winsomely written. Uh, uh, Dilla Hay is a good writer. And, um, and she basically all the way through the book, um, as she's dissecting all the temptations that come with envy, the kind of sin, the kind of temptation that nobody wants to admit to being susceptible to. Uh, envy really is a shameful sin, and, uh, and we don't pay much attention to it. We don't spend a lot of time defining it, uh, and Dillahay does. Now, the, the, the one possible caution, I'll, I'll start um, with this. Um, I've, I've got both the print version and uh, Audible. I listen to it in Audible. In the uh, something that's in the book, but not in the Audible um, uh, recording, is uh, in the acknowledgments or in the uh, at the very very tail end of the book. Uh, Dillahay um, addresses something that uh, I'm glad she addressed because as you're reading through, the one thing that might be a stumbling point for some people is that uh, Dillahay, um, in her, her treatment of this, 
at different points in the book, she tells some stories about her own struggles with envy against um, sisters and friends and whatnot. And initially, you might think, I, is this a little bit of overshare? You know, is this, <laughs> you know, is this too much? Um, is this too much information? TMI. And um, in the acknowledgments in the back, uh, uh, she tells an absolutely hilarious story. I won't narrate it for you here. But she tells a hilarious story that illustrates her awareness of um, how th these anecdotes or these illustrations might come across. Uh, she's very aware that it could be taken as overshare. And as long as she's aware of that and was guarding against that, then I'm, ha then I'm happy with what she did in the book. The, the problem would be if there had been no awareness that this might be too much uh, for us. The thing, the thing that's fantastic about the book is that all the way through, from beginning to end, sin is simply sin. It's not justified. It's not rationalized. It's not excused. It's we just have to deal with it. We have to confess it. We have to acknowledge it. We have to name it. And she cuts herself no slack, and she cuts the reader uh, no slack. This is just um, so. Um, seeing green uh, by Tilly Dillahay, and if it's, I, I think this is an, an ideal sort of book for like a, a book club or a women's, a women's book club or a, uh, if, a, if your small group is looking for a book to, uh, to do a book study uh, together, uh, this, this is just a, um, this is a subject that need, we, we need more uh, exhortations and teaching on it. And, and she just does a fantastic job. So there you go. So, we're still on episode 84 in our podcast. The Greek word, we're going we're gonna to be uh, spending two episodes on the same uh, Greek word, this uh, episode and the next one. Uh, the Greek word anomia, anomia, is rendered variously as iniquity or unrighteousness or transgression of the law. In Greek, the letter alpha, the prefix as, uh, um, is a term of negation, so... An agnostic is someone, a gnosis means knowledge. Agnostic is someone who claims to not know. A theist is someone who believes in God. An atheist is someone who uh, claims there is no God and so forth. So um, the prefix a is a term of negation. Uh, the Greek word for law is namos. And so anomia is iniquity or unrighteousness or the reverse of the law, the um, lawlessness. Uh, so we're going to begin with the places where this anomia is translated as iniquity. So Jesus says that in the last day, he's going to dismiss those who claimed to have done great, wor great works in his name, but who were actually workers of iniquity, Matthew 7.23. Also, at the last day, the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all the things that offend, along with all those who do iniquity. Uh, Matthew thirteen forty one. In his great rebuke of the theologians, Jesus calls them out as those who are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Matthew twenty three uh, twenty eight. And in his great prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus said that one of the warning signs would be that iniquity would abound. Matthew twenty four twelve. The apostle Paul pronounces a blessing on those whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered, Romans 4, 7. The characteristic of the unconverted is that they yield their members from iniquity to iniquity, Romans um, 6, 19. So holiness grows, uh, so does iniquity. Uh, we grow from faith to faith. We grow from love to love. We grow from iniquity to iniquity. We either climb the mountain um, or we ascend, descend into the caverns. So iniquity compounds. Iniquity grows. In 2 Thessalonians 2.7, Paul says that the mystery of iniquity was already at work. Jesus Christ died on the cross in order to redeem us from all iniquity, Titus 2.14. God loves righteousness and he hates iniquity, uh, Hebrews 1.9. And one of the great features of the new covenant is that God will remember our sins and our iniquities no longer. That's in Hebrews 8.12 and Hebrews 
You've spent a pleasant half hour with podcast proprietor Douglas Wilson. This podcast is produced by Canon Press. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening platform. To hear more from Doug, please visit canonpress.com.